funny. You were saying get your pens and pencils and paper. And I was reminded of Danny down in uh, Gretna. He gave a sermon uh, about a year ago or so, and he said, if you'd like a free transcript of this message, please get out your pencil and your paper and write it down. <laughs> just stuck with me. Danny, uh, he, Danny, I just when we go down there, and I, I love watching, I'm not about watching, excuse me, reading, there's a big whiteboard down there and he's got the schedule up of who's speaking for the for the sabbath and some scriptures and when sunset is and all that and just other things are just jokes like they would be called dad jokes on the board and it's just funny but sometimes danny when he speaks gives some of those out uh, when he speaks i just remember it makes me laugh if you want a free transcript of this message please get your pencil and notebook and write it down <laughs> i love it <laughs> that's what made me think of that so all right thank you josh again all right. Again, happy Sabbath, everyone. I'm always afraid when Josh says that about the blanket and stuff, I'm, people are going to start falling asleep. <laughs> so I'm going to be loud sometimes. Make sure you're awake. Pound on the desk. <laughs> uh, let's see. So today, and i got a lot of information today, so I believe this will be a, one of two parts, actually. One of two parts. So whenever I speak, whenever I'm able to speak again down the road, uh, I'll do part two. A lot of information. I could like I could cut some of it, but it's all good. I'll just make a. It's been a while since I've done a two-parter, so I th we'll just do that. It does contain. We'll look at things um, concerning us today in the world and how we are to react to it. Now, I actually thought about it. We talked a little bit about, as I'm sitting there this morning looking it over and adjusting it, like, well, we talked a little bit about it a couple weeks ago, self-control. So maybe it's a three-parter with two weeks ago being part one. I don't know. But I'd like us to turn to 2 Timothy 3 to start. Very familiar chapter. And I know we, many of us, not just myself, but other speakers, we've gone here and especially in the times that we live in and we see the news. And as I've said, I know Tom, when I speak with Tom and I talk with Steve and Bruce, it's like we say this a lot, but it's the times that we live in. We are living in times that we've never seen before. We see decisions being made, not only in our own government, but governments of other countries. You just shake your head and like, wow, what's the thinking going on? Second Timothy 3. Verse 1, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. And we could turn there, but I think of Isaiah 1, where Isaiah and I, you know, says our God's people don't know who they are. They don't consider. You know, the whole head, the whole body is sick from the head to the toe. Perilous times will come. Times of stress. That is the translation from perilous. Times of stress. And if we sit down and we're honest about it, we do feel st stress. We do feel it. It's there. As I made mention a couple weeks ago in the message I gave, you know, in, in self-control, we have to learn to control what we, can, what we can have control over. We can't be stressful, stressing out. And it's hard to do. I mean, I'm... As they say, preaching to the choir. I'm talking to myself. I'm talking to everybody in this room, everybody out there. And if you're new, you're, you're tuning in for the first time, or if you're going to hear this mes message, uh, you know, weeks down the road, um, we have to strive not to let that stress overcome us. There, these times are crazy. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control. See, there's the word right there. Brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong. And you think of the word headstrong, it's just even, it's a mindset. Especially when 
Paul's writing to Timothy here that the things that we see that are against God, they're so headstrong against God and so ingrained in their head. Or the things that don't make sense, they still make the decisions to continue doing the things that, have, that make no sense. Because they're headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And of course, he's talking to Timothy as a person, as an individual, and he says, for, from such people turn away. I think as in an overall arching thing, it's from their ideas and their thoughts turn away as well. Don't be a part of that. Stay away. We see it. We should not be. I mean, here's the obvious statement of the first five minutes of this message. We should not be like that as the children of God. We should not be partakers of that attitude, of that mindset. And if for something in there that we're struggling with, and we need to, as we mentioned a couple weeks ago, find, and Paul writes here, with the self-control, is there something we need to fix? And Paul continues talking to Timothy and said, For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts. And we talked about that a couple weeks ago, how lusts, we can, we can get wrapped up in lusts or things that we really want, and it could be our downfall or the easy way. What's the easy way? What's something that we really, you know, we, we don't really need, but we want it so bad that maybe we'll jeopardize something important to us to get it. It says, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith, but they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all, as theirs also was. And part of this, too, he's talking about false teachers. Talking about false teachers. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, as Iconium, and Lystra, what persecutions I endured. And out of them all the Lord delivered me. You know? So Paul's reminding him, saying, I went through this. I, I, you know, People saw me go through this. You saw me go through the, all these things, Timothy. And the Lord was with me. And the Lord delivered me. says, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And that's key, too. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. There is, and, and we've talked about it for us old-timers, as we say. We know we're going to go to a few scriptures to remind us, but also for anybody new watching. We have an enemy that's being allowed to deceive and we have to remember that. As it says, you know, Paul, when he's talking about the, the armor of God, Paul reminds us that we don't fight against the physical. We fight against the spiritual. We fight against our enemy who has been allowed to deceive others. And we have to remember that. We still do what we do. You know, I remember hearing a sermon several years ago saying, you know, if you look at it, Noah was the most unsuccessful preacher of all time. <laughs> He's out there building a boat. And not one person, well, Scripture records, not one person from the town, from around the area, came to their senses, said, please save, how, do, how can I be saved? I'm sure Noah was out there. Maybe they did ask him. I'm sure Noah said why, what you could do. And to be honest, his family was only saved because of Noah. Scripture says that. The world's deceiving itself, but also there's a grand enemy. We have an enemy that's being allowed to be de deceived. 
uh, de allowed to deceive those out there. But he says, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Yeah, Paul says, well, you can look at me, but we know, we know where this all comes from. It comes from our Savior, Jesus Christ. His words, his teachings, what he went through. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Training in righteousness. Discipline in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Then he says in verse 1 of chapter 4, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Now, again, let's take it into context first. He's talking to Timothy, who was being trained to be a successor to Paul, to be a, you know, a messenger of Christ. He's telling Timothy, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. We, well, we all can be ready. It can come from anywhere. I believe it was Wednesday. Was it Thursday? I don't remember. It was this week. I was at school. It was after school. I was in the office. Karen was there too. And we were just having a slight, uh, uh, a, you know, pleasant conversation, nothing about work, just having a conversation with our two secretaries. And one of them said, hey, I have a question. I said, oh, okay. She goes, I, I hope I don't come across wrong. I'm, like, I'm thinking, well, is it, if it's a, I'm not thinking, what could it be about? And she come right out and said, what church do you belong to? I, she goes, I know, I know you don't keep Christmas. You, you, and she's talking about both of us. Karen was off to the side talking, still talking with our other secretary. So I know you don't keep Christmas. And I know you keep the holy days. And she even mentioned a couple of them, you know, by name. I said, yep, that's right. And it, we just talked about it, of course. And then Allie's there. And it was, kind, it was really cool because I, I stopped talking and let Allie explain it. And our and our secretary asked Allie, "Which one's your favorite of all the all the all the, all the, all the holy days? Which one's your favorite?" And Allie said, "Tabernacles." See, so you can come any time. God's still calling. How much more He's calling, I don't know. I like to think, and I prayed about it afterwards. I I, I prayed that we did it on you know, God's service there. We planted a seed. Because we've continued to talk about it. We talked for about uh, 10 minutes or so, maybe 15, about things. I, I, in my head, I kept telling myself, I don't want to jam too much down. Got to take little bites. <laughs> like, you know, as Paul says, milk, just a little bit. Showed her the, because she's sitting with a computer. Said, well, we do have a website. Oh, yeah, what is it? Brought it up. Right then and there, was God working? I pray that he was. And as I said, we, I prayed that we did God's service there and didn't, you know, did the, you know, we said the right things, did the right things to plant that seed. Because it says convince. Be ready in season, out of season. You don't know when somebody's going to ask you. And that's happened to me a few times in my lifetime. People just out of the blue, you don't expect it. Sometimes it catches you off guard, and that's what I told Karen. I said, you know, it catches you off guard, so you gotta like take a moment and like, you, you like pray in your head, like, oh, I don't wanna mess this up, I don't wanna screw this up. I gotta make sure it's, it's you know, I know, I know how to answer the question, but just it catches you off guard. 
Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up from themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Again, he's talking to Timothy. Fulfill our work. Fulfill our job. You know, another thing that was said the other day there in that office, she was just talking. She goes, yeah, I grew up, I grew up, you know, as, as a Catholic. She said that. She goes, I grew up a Catholic and none of it made sense. And she said, and then she, she made mention that, uh, yeah, I, I was hanging out with a, a Jewish family uh, a couple years ago, and a lot of these holy days and things make sense. And we had a quick conversation about, the, and I, I, again, I was like, I don't want to give her too much information, don't want us the steak instead of the milk, you know. And I just kind of, maybe this is the hook, maybe it's the holy days. Different people have different hooks. Maybe the hooks is the holy days. And I said, yeah. I said, that's inter and I just kind of said, you know, it's interesting that most people have the misconception that they're only Jewish holy days. But if you look back, the tribe of Judah is one of 12 tribes, and God gave all the tribes the information. And I said, that, you know, that, that information has been lost in history. I didn't want to come out and say, well, this, you know, the devil's been deceiving people. I didn't want to do that, just kind of ease into it. And she goes, yeah, I can kind of see, I, I see that. Well, again, hopefully a seed's been planted. And that should be great and wonderful. So Paul's saying, as the ones that have been entrusted with the truth, we don't know when we'll be asked. We don't know when our opportunity will be. Will we be those lights that he tells us to be? It's just amazing when you have those conversations. But Paul's also telling Timothy, you keep going what you know. You keep showing what you know. Don't fall back into the world. Don't, don't give up. He says, be watchful in all things. He tells him, fulfill your ministry. We have to fulfill what we are told to do. As I mentioned a couple weeks ago, you know, sometimes we can get worked up. We can. It's not, you know, it's not hard if we allow ourselves to get worked up over what we see in the world. We see these things happening. It brings tears to our eyes because of what we see and what we hear, what's going on. It stirs up our very souls because it breaks. When we see these things happening, it breaks so many of God's laws. And, you know, his laws, which consider, you know, his commandments. The things that he told Israel to do, he tells us to do. That we're learning to do, you know, whether it's to keep the Sabbath on the, on the right day of the week. To keep the holy days. To follow the commandments. To live as best as we can a righteous life. And stay away from sin. We see these things happening and... Sometimes, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, it might stir up anger. But we have to be careful that that anger does not be, is not misplaced or misdirected. We did read scripture a couple weeks ago. It says, you know, you can be angry about something, but don't sin. We can hate the sin, but not the person. As I made mention here in the beginning of this message, we understand, I hope that we understand that there's a great deceiver. And he's been allowed to deceive the world, deceive family members, friends, people that we work with, co-workers, and they don't understand yet. We were once like that. We were once there, deceived. In many different ways, many different avenues, we were all deceived 
when we see these things happening in our world, could be near us. You know, in our communities. The decisions being made, people make choices. Choices affect other people than just ourselves. What should it stir up? Patience. Compassion. And love. And love. We have to continually understand and remember. I guess the word is remember. Although all of this is going on in the world. How we need to be. How we need to be with patience, compassion, and love. Ezekiel 28. This is the part where I want to talk about our enemy a little bit. Ezekiel 28. And it's found in verses 11 through 16. Where the transition is made to talking about Lucifer. How he was the seal of perfection. Full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. How he was in Eden, the garden of God. And I had all these beautiful stones for his covering. Verse 14, he was the anointed cherub that covers. He was one of the cherubs that covered the mercy seat, the throne of God. Perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you, verse 15. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore I cast you out, cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. He's the prince of the power of the air. We need proof. Ephesians 2, chapter 2, verse 2. Paul writes. in which you once walked according to the course of this world. Now this goes back to the theme we just mentioned a few months ago. We were there. We were deceived. We were called at different times. Sometimes we were called and we accepted the calling and some of us fell backwards. We've been there. I pray that none of us are there now. In what, which you once walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit which, who now works in the sons of disobedience. We were there. God had compassion on us by opening our minds. Mercy on us. He hasn't done that yet. With a major, uh, well, what, 90 some percent of the world yet. Hasn't done that yet. Throughout history, he hasn't done that. Because it says in verse 1, and you, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. And then again, verse 2, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. So he's talking to the people, the converted members of the body of Christ in Ephesus. Remember where you came from. Remember who you are now. In Christ, we have truth. In Christ, we have a promise. We have hope. 
And he says in verse 10, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We walk according to the way that God walks, the way our Savior walked and teaches us still to this day. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. It says, Whose minds the God of this age has blinded. He's been allowed to blind those. He's been allowed to blind if God's will was it to 100% of us. We know this. We understand this. And anybody new watching, you're being called. I have no doubt about that. Something doesn't make sense to you and you've reached out to God. Because God has possibly touched your mind. Because again, Paul, if we back ourselves up to verse 2, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. That goes back to what Matthew, you know, in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, where Christ said, you can't hide a light. You can't hide a light. Be the light. Shine ourselves. We are seen. I've said, I know I've said that before. We are seen. We're just not mind readers. That we can read the minds of those who do see us and maybe they have a question. You know, we can't read minds. So hopefully we pray to God that if God calls somebody, have them ask a question. Ask us. We give them an answer. We plant a seed. We give it over to God. But if we're acting in, in deceitfulness or craftiness, then we're not being a light. And we're just like any Joe Schmo in the street. Sorry, I don't mean to offend anybody named Joe Schmo. But as we read in the you know in Timothy. Don't be like that. Turn away from those attitudes. Don't be like that. Don't be hidden. And again, that's hard to do. Stress has come on us. Revelation 12, verse 9. Just to make sure that we understand and we remember who our enemy is. Prince of the power of the air. God of this age. Revelation 12, verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accursed them before our God day and night has been cast down. He accuses us. Need the example? Go to Job. Go to the book of Job and see how he accuses and blames. Do we fear God for nothing? And we know that he has a short time, as it says there in verse 12. It says, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and who who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. That's why the stresses are increasing. That's why what we see in our world happening evil that doesn't make sense 
no common sense. These things are happening because he's allowed to, to do it. And we have to remember that. He hates and loathes God's law and salvation plan. He hates it. Hates it. He knows the final outcome. He knows it. He doesn't care. He's out to deceive and to destroy. He plots and he conspires to destroy everything of God, including the people of God. And when I said earlier, when we see these things happening in the world, we can't resort to hate and anger. It's got to be compassion, understanding. I guess one of the greatest examples is time of year. We know it's wrong to celebrate the birth of Christ on December 25th. We know it's wrong. But how do we approach it when we're when we're asked about it from other people. Are we understanding because we understand that they're deceived? Or do we get angry about it and say, well, you shouldn't be doing that because it's wrong. Well, it is wrong. It is wrong, and I disagree with that. But how do we present ourselves? It doesn't have to be just this time of year either, though. We know a majority of the world keeps Sunday as the, as the Sabbath. How do we react to that when people talk to us and, a, and ask about it? Don't do it. It's wrong. Stop doing it. It's a weekly Sabbath. It should be on Saturday. Or do we just talk to them and present what we know? Say, well, we do it on Saturday. Scripture says the seventh day. And if they don't want to listen, that's on them. Walk away, all right? We can give examples. Again, but it's always that balancing act of is it too much information or do we get to the point it's, it's an argument? No, we don't want that. Because then we've just not shown our light. I think I said that right. We have just not shown our light. We're there to show our light, to show what we do, how we handle things. Satan hates mankind. He loathes God's truth. And we just read where Paul said, don't handle it deceitfully or with craftiness. So we just come out with love okay, and compassion and patience. All right. All right. Of course, there's examples too of we keep getting asked. It's like, didn't I tell you already that? Oh, they say, oh, oh, thanks for asking again. This is what we do. This is what we keep. That's how we do it. Scripture says. And like I said earlier, it's always off. I say, like, oh, they're asking a question. I got, I got to be ready. Just like Paul tells Timothy to be in season and out of season. Satan will stop at nothing. Our enemy will stop at nothing. To derail the plan of God. He tried it in Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11, where he tempted Christ. <laughs> Went to him, one on one. If you're hungry, make these stones into bread. Oh, if, well, if you're really, truly the Son of God, jump off the building. He'll send his angels. Oh, you don't have to go through all this. I'm the ruler of this world. And that's the irony. The one truth that he did say. I'll give you all the nations. Bow down and worship me. And I thought, I thought about that. I thought maybe I should have said that two weeks ago when we were talking about the easy way. The easy way, the convenient way. 
There's our enemy saying, you don't have to go through all this. I'll give it to you. If you just bow down and worship me. And what and every single time, what did our Savior use as defense? The scriptures. Didn't attack. He used the scriptures to say, nope, scripture says this. You, know, you shall you know live by not you live by the words of God. I know I'm paraphrasing it. I could go to Matthew and read it verbatim. But the point is, we use our Savior, Jesus Christ, as the example. And we worship no one but God the Father, through Christ. And follow those examples. So that's, a, that's something we need to remember, that our enemy has been allowed to attack, to deceive, to hold the world hostage. And they don't know it. But as Noah and Abraham and Joseph and all the examples that we have in the Bible, including our Savior, Jesus Christ, we are to keep going, to keep being patient, compassion, love. You know, because Matthew 4, let's go to Matthew 4, verse, let's... Uh, was it Matthew 4? Well, it wasn't Matthew 4. Sorry, it wasn't Matthew 4. It was Matthew 5. Let's go to Matthew 5. See, as we, we have to understand our role in all this. And I am going to go to the scripture that I made mention up a few minutes ago. Matthew 5. Verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. I think that means a little bit more to me now that I've been to the UP three times this past summer, seeing the lighthouses in person. I mean, this one's majestic, the red one here. Standing out there like a beacon of hope. The light going. Of course, Whitefish Point up there in the UP of Michigan. On the very edge. Being a beacon of light to those, the ships that came through Lake Superior. And what happened if those lights went out? To read the stories, to hear the stories of the light keepers, lighthouse keepers. How they had to be on duty, how they had to share duties, two families at one time, you know, twelve-hour shifts to make sure. Well, well, obviously, the light doesn't come on during the day, but during the fog, if it's foggy, they had fog horns, and they each had that. Each one had a pattern for both the light and the fog horn to know to let the sailors know where they were at. They couldn't let that light go out. They had to make sure the fog horn worked if it was foggy. Or lives would be lost. It says, you are a light of the world. Verse 15, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Our good works. And I know the world, they've been deceived. Many people have been deceived. And if we continue to read verse 17, he, our Savior even comes out and says, He hasn't done away with the commandments. But the world has been deceived to think they have been. What do we do with that? Well, we just we read Scripture. If somebody says, see, a majority of the world does not understand. They may have heard it, they just don't understand it yet. Maybe they've heard it from us. 
and still don't understand. They may come back to us and say, why do you do this? How come you can't come over and help me on this day? How come you can't come here to this day? Like, oh, I can't, it's a Sabbath. Or I'm gone, I'm out of town, I'm on a holy day. How come you can't come into work this day? I can't. And there's many stories and many brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ that have made that stand and they have been blessed, but also maybe their workplace has been blessed or their family has been blessed. Again, I go back to the example of Noah. Only Noah was, was, was righteous in God's eyes. But because of his righteousness and what he did, and Noah, he, he, God saved his family too. Leviticus 23, we go to Leviticus 23 and we read about the holy days. and we, Those are the scriptures we could use. Like if that's the hook, like it happened to me the other day. The hook was the holy days. So we talked a little bit about the holy days. And the sentence was said, oh, that makes sense. I, I, that makes sense because they're there. It's, it's, it's there. God said, keep them. <laughs> Maybe the hook is heaven versus hell. I have personal experience. I know somebody came to me many years ago and said, it just doesn't make sense that people go to heaven. It just doesn't make sense to me. Well, let's sit down and look at scriptures. What does the Bible say? The world does not understand repentance. Let's go to Isaiah 3. The world doesn't. As a whole, the world doesn't understand. Because you know why? Because the ruler of this world doesn't understand it. The ruler of this world could care less about it. Repenting. Because they don't understand what sin is. Because that's been kept from them, been deceived. Isaiah 3, verse 8. For Jerusalem stumbled and Judah has fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord. To provoke the eyes of his glory, they look on their continents, witnesses against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to their soul, for they have brought evil upon themselves. We see that in the world today. And let me make this clear too. Like we, when we speak on the Day of Atonement, yeah, our enemy deceives, but some of this is man-made choice too. It's a choice. Let's not, let's not, you know. They don't hide it. They don't hide it anymore. I think back to a sermon I heard back at the Winter Family Weekend. It was back in 2017. It was the main sermon of the, of the weekend. And they were talking about sexual immorality. Talking about the gay movement. Same-sex marriage. And that, you know, I know we've all talked about it. Tom has, Bruce has, Steve has, I have. We've talked about it. Many speakers have. I just remember it because it said this this same-sex marriage is the thing that finally broke down the barrier. Anything is now acceptable. Anything is now acceptable. There's no longer any excuses for the world to be as, in, as indecent as it wants to be. No accountability things and as we read earlier we're going to be persecuted we're starting to be the bad guys we're the bad guys we're you know we're whatever 
against change. We're not progressive enough. There, there's the word I was thinking of, trying to find. When it's not, it's not about being progressive. It has nothing to do with that. It's about keeping God's word. You know, whatever it is, excuses for whatever sin can be. And God has allowed it. Just like he allowed Pharaoh's heart to be hardened when Israel was leaving Egypt. Egypt was defeated. That tenth plague, that tenth plague wrecked havoc. Wrecked havoc on that nation. And Pharaoh just said, go. Take him, go. Go, get out. But Pharaoh's heart became hardened, was allowed to become hardened because God allowed it. He was, oh, get the chariots. We're going to go get them, bring them back or kill them. Matthew 15. Matthew 15. Matthew 15, verse 7 says, and these are, these are the words of our Savior. He says, hypocrites. Because he's talking to the scribes and Pharisees. Now he is talking to people that should know the truth of God. The Pharisees, they were descendants of, you know. He says, hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth. And honor me with their lips. But their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. This world has been deceived to follow traditions of men instead of the commandments of God. That will be taken care of when Christ comes back. When people ask us about our faith and what we do, we, we talk to them. We show them scriptures. We pray again that a seed has been planted. We cannot become like the world. The world, if you don't agree with them, will browbeat you. Will pass laws, says that, oh, guess what? If you don't follow... Follow us and do what we tell you to do. You're going to lose your job. You may not be able to go shopping or go into stores and this, that, and the other thing. We see it happening. We can't fight fire with fire. We can't. That's not how God works. His people are to fight with love. Stand up with love. I don't know if even the word fight's the right word to use. We're supposed to stand tall with love, compassion, patience. At the cost of ourselves? Yeah, that's what Paul writes. Paul, read Paul's letters. But not at the cost of what we believe in. We can't allow ourselves to be like the world. Romans 12. I don't have it written down, it just popped in my head. Romans 12. The first part of verse 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Paul says, Be transformed. And really, the whole chapter here, Romans 12, is a blueprint of how, how to be. He says, don't be conformed to this world. But verse 21, the very last verse of chapter 12, do not be overcome by evil. We can't be like the world. We may think we have good intentions. But how's the world do it? 
We see how the world is doing it if you don't agree with them. If you don't do it our way. Do not be overcome do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The good of what? The good of the of God, the good of Christ, the truth. We let God handle it. Verse 19 of that chapter. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Put in God's hands. We talked a little bit about that two weeks ago. We put in God's hands. We control what we can control. Pray to God. Ask God to take it. Handle it. Therefore, verse 20, Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. If a deceived person comes and asks you about your faith, all right, it says, feed him. Feed him the word of God. Say, okay, well, this, we do it this way because in Leviticus it says, keep the holy days. In Isaiah it says, keep from doing your own pleasure on the Sabbath day. It says in Genesis, the seventh day. We saw it, talked about it earlier. We didn't go there, Matthew 4, where Christ used scriptures against And I know we could use the examples of Christ getting angry, turning the tables over. He didn't sin, though. And like I said, I said two weeks ago, we can get angry. We can get upset. But also, as I said at the beginning of this message, don't let that anger be misplaced or misdirected. We can be angry about the sin. We can be upset that somebody we love is being de deceived. But don't let that anger turn into hatred. Don't let that anger put a wall up. We do it out of love and compassion, reminding them, teaching them, telling them. And then, like I said, if we plant a seed, we pray about it. Ask that God would, His will be done. And we could go to the parables of the seeds and say, some of it doesn't take because of the stresses and the, of the cares of this world. We can't be deceived into doing things like the world does. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 11. We're getting to the close here of part 1. 2 Corinthians 11. Verse 14. Paul writes and he tells the church in Corinth, he says, and no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Because God has allowed it. God has allowed it. We need proof for this. Let's go to Matthew 11. Matthew 11. Matthew 11, verse 25. At that time, Jesus, and an Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. It's part of his plan, part of their plan, to hide it. 
on a personal level, level, think about that for a minute. How precious, or what what thing in you and us that he sees that, you know what, I'm going to reveal it to that person. Tabernacles, the kids learned about the Pearl of Great Price. I mean, that's, to be on a positive note, the thing that really stands out is, what does he see in each one of us that we were touched and called out? And that struggle happened. You know what? This doesn't seem right. There's something de better, something different. That changing of that mind to reveal it, it's part of his plan. It's a good reminder for us to go through because we used to be there. We used to be there. Matthew 13. Matthew 13, verse 10. And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? Why do you do it this way? He point blank answered the question. He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear, and shall not understand. We see that. When we talk to maybe family members or friends or co-workers, when they ask, They hear, they don't understand, unless God steps in. We just read Matthew 11, unless God steps in. That's why we pray for God. When we do say it, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For assuredly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see, and did not see it. And to hear what you hear, did not hear it. And then that's when the parable of the, the hearers, the, the, sow, the sower and the seeds comes into play. For their reason and their purpose only, they're only calling people. They're allowing our enemy to deceive the nations. And God calls those he calls according to his will and his way. Why? That's his, his will and his way. And that's something that's out of our control. Just like when we were deceived, we were in our sins. We didn't know we were in our sins. We didn't know we were deceived. We didn't have no control over that until our minds were touched and things started to be opened up to us. Then we had a choice of, do I want to keep doing this? Do I want to go, oh, this is information I'm reading, I'm taking it in? Or, oh, never mind. You know, never mind, it sounded good. That's the parable of the parable of the, the sower and the seeds. Now that our minds have been opened, we are to be those lights and to show how God has blessed us. And it's okay to say that. Sometimes we're saying, oh, I really don't want to say God. Yeah, God blesses us. It's okay to say, you know what? I truly believe God blessed me because I keep the Sabbath day. I believe God blessed me because I went to tabernacles and I, or I keep the other holy days. I believe that in my heart. It's okay to say that. We are to be positive in the word of God, not negative. 
We are to be positive in the Word of God. Show the light. Because I know I read it, but I'm going to go back and read it. That last part, verse 16. I think that's a good place to stop today. We'll pick it up the next time I'm asked to speak. Of how we can continue to be lights and to be ready for the end of the age, which I believe is coming rapidly. Matthew 5, verse 16. I think it's a good place to end today. Part 1. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, that they see you, and glorify your Father in heaven. I think there's a hymn that says something, not exactly like that, but do our actions point them to Christ? Do we, to the best of our ability, we make mistakes. I, I'll say that because we're human. I've said that many times. There's times we mess up and we sin or we say something stupid or we do something stupid and we're caught and we don't get, I mean, we're not giving God the glory then when that happens. But we got to strive how we talk, how we act, how we present what we know to those around us. So God is given the glory, not because of us. That's what Paul was writing to Timothy about. Yeah, you see me. You see what I do. But remember where you learned it from. From Christ. From our Savior. That's what we need to remember and keep doing. So may God continue to be with us, guide us, help us, because we need to hold fast. It's a mess out there, but we got to keep doing what we're asked to do through patience, compassion, and love.